Welcome to our master class on early childhood development and sensory needs. And today what I'm going to do is I'm joined by two really long time friends of mine. They post in our Pathways Connect Southwest Florida group all the time. Whenever there's questions about childhood development, uh, school readiness, uh, what's going on in schools uh, for children who are struggling, uh, they've really been very good resources for me personally and for a lot of families in Southwest Florida over the last decade that I've gotten to know them. Um, both Catherine and, and Jessica have a ton of experience that they're bringing to the table here. Um, they've worked with kids for a very long time and they, they also share the perspective of honoring a child that we also try to do when we're bringing our parenting games together. Um, so uh, I'd like to introduce you uh, to, to Catherine. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, just go ahead and uh, tell the people who are watching today a little bit about yourself, a little bit about, about your background. And kind of the fun question is what gets you so like drooly about working with kids? <laughs> um, well, from the moment I was young, I knew I would work with children. I knew I was going to have uh, like, a, I wanted a basketball team. That's what I wanted. I'm close. Guys, I'm really close. I've made it to four, but I think I'm old enough to say I'm probably done. Um, but I actually started out in the public sector and then found Montessori with the birth of my own first born child. And that changed my life. Like that is where I completely saw a difference. Um, I knew that public education was not my cup of tea. And when I saw what I wanted for my son, I was the weird parent that was parenting way different than everyone else. And they loved it, but they just didn't know what to do with it. And I can say that when I had my son, I didn't really know how to label it either. I just knew I was doing what my gut told me. Um, so when I found Montessori, that um, kind of gave me the coined term and it took me down the road of all my master's studies that I did. So I am a Montessori certified teacher. Um, and I spent about 10 to 15 years in the classroom doing Montessori work in early childhood. I have since, as my children have gotten older, moved in to what I feel was a natural shift into more of the exceptional education world. I found myself with my own two children. I have two that have some varying needs um, with learning and it really drove me to see what's missing in our educational system and where we need some advocacy for parents. So I started doing um, exceptional ed work in the public sector again, which has opened my eyes to a whole new new platform. I never thought I could do it, but to be able to say that I'm in those fields doing what I know is best and honoring those children with Montessori lessons and helping them reach their potential that I don't think any other teachers could realize. So that has been a blessing with the birth of my fourth child and the grace of COVID, I guess you can say. I am staying home currently um, and trying to honor that sweet little infant in all of this exact development that we're going to talk about today. So I do have four children ranging in ages from 17 all the way to one years old. So definitely got the, the bases covered. <laughs> Jessica, it's your turn. Yeah, Jessica, <laughs> what, uh, introduce yourself. Uh, let everybody know what your background is. Uh, tell us about your kids and what, what makes you so passionate about, about working with children and, and helping our little community. Absolutely. Hello, my name is Jessica Vernig, and I've been in early childhood for over 25 years, officially. Unofficially, I always say I got my start in this because my little brother was born when I was 15, and um, which was a definitely a momentous occasion in my life, but also really taught me how much I loved to observe the development and, and see the changes and, and teach the little ones. Um, what spoke to me, I, my career path was a little different because I didn't always know I wanted to work with children. I knew I loved working with children. My whole life, everyone told me you should be a teacher. And I always, like most of society, when I heard teacher, I thought elementary school teacher. And um, I just knew that wasn't quite what I wanted to do. And so I always said, oh, thank you. And that's nice. And But um, I... Um, knew I wanted to be a great mom and I knew I wanted to have children, but I wasn't so convinced that teaching was where I wanted to go. And so I actually went to school for business and I was only one semester away from my business degree when I was literally flipping through the course catalog for my college just for whatever reason and saw that you could get a degree in early childhood. And I had had no idea. I mean, still much of our society doesn't realize 
how big of a professional world early childhood is, you know, beyond like the concept of daycare centers. But back 25 years ago, we certainly didn't understand that. And so I certainly knew that daycare centers existed or whatever, but I didn't understand that you could have a professional career in early childhood and the difference in that. And um, it completely opened up my world. I was managing a restaurant and thinking about buying it. We'd exchange financials and stuff. And I quit my job, started nannying for infant twins my major and completely changed my whole life. Um, and what spoke to me the most as I learned about child development and child development theory was reflecting on my own life. I was always that kind of student who could not care about school, not show up for school sometimes, and cram for a test and go in and get an A because I could you know, cram for a multiple choice test and go in and, and ace that. Did it mean that I was really learning? Not necessarily. Did it mean that I cared about what I was doing? Not necessarily. Um, and when I learned about early childhood theory and I learned about the importance of having work be meaningful and connected to children's lives and relevant and all those kinds of theories, it was huge light bulbs. And a hundred percent made sense to me because that was the difference for me. I went from someone, I went to school for business because I had taken accounting in high school and I was good at it and I knew I could make money doing it. And so I was like, okay, but I was never engaged in college. I didn't spend one minute in my college more than I had to. I worked and I always used to joke that my car knew how to get to the grocery store and how to work. And that was it. Like I didn't, I wasn't involved at all. And the moment I changed to early childhood, I spent all my time at school and was reading and getting involved just to do it because I found my passion. And so that really taught me the difference when kids find their passion. And when you help them do that, the engagement you're going to see in them and the difference you're going to see in them versus when they're doing the mundane stuff, just to jump through the hoops, just to do it. Those are two very different, different aspects of learning. And um, it fueled my entire career to have seen that difference in my own self. That's cool. You want to, you want to give a shout out to your kids too? I do have three children. They are uh, nine, 10, and 14. That's fantastic. Um, yeah. So one of the things that, that we've all really had in common is, is this focus on, I, Jessica, I think, I think you really started to allude to it, that previously, as I was growing up, I was in early childhood education as kind of like it was daycare, right? And so we were doing a lot of work that was just kind of like making the, the horses go into the barn and sitting around watching cartoons. And there wasn't a whole lot of actual meaningful work going on. And now as a doctor who works with kids all the time, I see the opportunities that we have even to pick up things in infancy to start hacking their brains so that we can access different things and really help them explore their potential uh, for a lot of really cool things that children can do. Um, emotional development and the sensory development and the ways that they interact and social development all can be done if we, if we are really conscious about the ways that we engage not only as parents, but educators and doctors with these children. And so since, uh, Catherine, you mentioned that, that we've had this blessing of COVID, uh, the great pause, I like to call it, a lot of parents have been kind of shifted uh, away from dropping their children off to a place, and now they're in the home and trying to figure out, well, how do I still meet these needs? So what I'd like to hear from with you guys is maybe some of the, some tools uh, that you've discovered or you have experimented with both professionally and within your own homes that parents might want to explore um, to figure out, okay, first off, does my children have some sensory needs right now that might need to be engaged? And then if they do, what are some tools? So I think I wanna start with the, the first question here is, how do you pick up in, I know, Catherine, you have the, the infancy. We, we talked about some of, some of your professional experience. Um, if we want to go for infancy, and Jessica, if you want to talk um, uh, about early childhood, how do we know if, if, we're, if, if we're going into a sensory like window? Um, so when it's interesting because I've always, since my children were young, raised my children in the classroom. So I was a Montessori teacher. I had this beautiful environment 
grace to my children because I worked there and they just went to school with me. Um, so I can relate to the people that are coming home with nothing um, more than ever, but, but it, and it's hard because I'm that Montessori teacher that knows all of the materials that my child should have. Um, and I can't afford them all. You know, I can't afford to create a classroom. Um, you know, I'm doing the best I can, but there, the, the, the crutch of it is to become the scientist. And that's the biggest shift that I see that needs to happen is that we are so often observing our children to be kind of just excited and, oh my goodness, look at what they did. And we see it just for the actual, they put something together or they fixed a puzzle. But to actually step back and to look at the mindfulness that it took and the work and to watch the repetition that they had to go through and the, the way they moved their hand, the way they held the object in their hand and then it had to shift in order to fit the piece in, that science is what will transform us as adults in the environment at home to know what our children need next. So that's the biggest shift that I can say is that we, we need to be scientists. Um, and Montessori had said it best is that we are just as much the spiritual guide to these children to bring them up in the world, to honor them, to respect them, to help them become human beings. But we have to equally match that with being the scientist because without tweaking our environment, without offering the correct um, materials, and it does not have to be $500 Montessori materials. Um, currently for a posting activity, I have a, um, an old um, toilet, like a um, paper towel holder. That's like an old, it's old. I don't even know where I found it. It was probably like a flea market somewhere, but it's just an old base. It has a cylinder on top. And then I got bangle bracelets. And Elena, my one-year-old spends hours upon hours just posting these on them and then trying to get them off and getting them off is hard and watching how she gets it off and she pulls it close to the wood and so then it can't come up. Those are those scientific moments that we have to start paying attention to. So watching our children and being proud of them, which we are proud and I want parents to be excited and I want parents to have that because um, I'm not going to say that I don't send Jessica moments and I say, oh my gosh, look what Alina did. We're all human. Okay. We're human. We get that. But I'm saying after you send Jessica the video, <laughs> then I want to sit back and say, what's next? What's coming? What did it take to get here? So it's, it's being that scientist at every developmental stage from the moment they're born and they are suckling their like moving their way up to your chest to fig and watching that for what it really means um and i can say with each child i have been able to embrace that and enjoy that so much more um no one can do anything perfect the first child that just wipe that right out of your head because it's not going to happen and if you try you are going to fail and be very very frustrated so that that's not that's not the key to for us to be perfect um i am a montessori certified teacher and i can tell you that i am not perfect right now raising my one-year-old because it's impossible to do that um, but i can tell you that i watch her with a scientific eye and i watch her the movement and i sit back and and i do take lots of videos a lot of times as weird as it may sound i take the video so that i can re-watch it to see what's going on and that's another great tool I find that rewatch the video is not just for the smile on your face that it brings, but to watch how they accomplish the task that they are doing. Um, so we can get a little bit more detailed if we want, um, but let's, while we're kind of there, shift to the, um, as they get into the older stages from the infancy, you know, we've watched them crawl now, we've, we've watched how the, the, 
the left side is the one that always moves first or does the right side always move first? Um, did they take their first steps, you know, and did they take it with their left foot first? Did they take it with their right? Are they balanced in the sense that do they, do they go with their left foot first and their right foot first for those, those while they're figuring it out? Um, parents always ask that question of, are my children left-handed or right-handed? I hope that I can't tell any time in the early days. If I can tell early on, there is something not quite right. I don't want to be able to tell. I want to be able to see that child using this left hand equally to the right hand. I want to see the left hand crawling just looking the same as the right. And again, that, that video is going to be your best bet to watch some of these movements and to see if everything looks kind of balanced. Um, and this is going to take us into that sensory development that a lot of us aren't familiar with. Um, if you don't have a background like the three of us do, you know, it's not, it's not out there in our community. It's not being taught. It's certainly not being taught. I have my um, master's in education for early, for, for education, like K through six. I never heard anything about sensory, did not hear anything about sensory until I got my Montessori training. So, you know, it is not, it is not pervasive. It is not what people talk about. So it is going to be our job to be scientists for our children and watch these movements so that when they get to that three, four, and then what Jessica works with primarily is the pre-K students, we've opened their door because we've scientifically seen what, what they started like. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, even in, in, you know, we don't get it when we go through chiropractic school. It was, it was a special class I took postgraduate that introduced me to the whole idea of sensory processing and that the idea that we all have sensory systems that might be a little, you know, we have Goldilocks zones and a little too loud and a little defensive um, and being able to figure out not that there's good or bad to them, but how do we maximize that window as they go through? There's different windows, uh, whether you're two or, or the same sense could also be active when you're six. And so how do we feed that differently? It's a, it's a really good point. And Jessica, you, I, I have had the pleasure of teaching at both of your guys' schools, um, multiple schools for, for Catherine, um, but, but uh, I've gotten to see like the insides of your classrooms, but I've also had the unique experience of seeing, of getting to know on a really personal basis, the children that you teach, not only your children, but also kids that I see come through. And one of the things that I want uh, Jessica to kind of like start off with yours is that I know the kids that go through your program are some of the um, kindest, and and most like ready to I, I have dinner with some of these children and 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 how they use their forks and their knives and they're these little people and you go wow I am really impressed by your manners and how all that works um, can you tell me a little bit about your philosophy for early childhood education sure. and 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 what you think the important things are for parents to be able to uh, be able to mirror or take into their into their homes as well absolutely um, and and interestingly enough um, I. Both my degrees, I specialized in infant. So even though I, uh, my career has, has moved uh, and, and, and landed in a place where I do primarily pre-K, for the last 12 years, I've primarily done pre-K. Um, my my um, foundation is all in, in infant development. And I think that's the whole piece you know, that Catherine was alluding to and you were alluding to is that we often aren't educated well um, unless we seek that education in that foundation. Because I intentionally specialized both my degrees in, in infancy. Um, I was able to receive a lot of that, um, but I wouldn't have normally. Um, I was always in my classes going, wait, what about infant toddler? Wait, what about infant toddler? Um, and then that has that background has unserved me well moving forward. Um, one thing I love about this is even though it can sound complicated, it's so simple. Um, and we discussed the idea of um, you know, what, what previous decades of daycare looked like and how that's influenced both of us. Mm -hmm. um, but I never want to say that in a derogatory way, because one thing that we continue to learn through research is that a lot of things that parents and teachers have done for years are so good for kids. And now we just have the research that tells us why. And so the difference now and the difference in the modern age of, you know, why are we even having this discussion right now? Why would parents want to watch this? Is because we do know enough now to be really intentional about it. So it's that intentionality as a teacher and as a parent that really makes the difference now. 
but it's not because we necessarily need these fancy equipment or fancy programs. Things like having that cabinet in your kitchen, that's the yes cabinet where kids can pull out canned goods and the Tupperware and things like having them help you with the laundry and push and pull that heavy laundry basket into the other room or help sort the, the clothing or help learn how to fold the washcloth. That is all the kind of stuff that any kind of fancy discussion is going to bring you to. And so I think that's an important piece for parents to always realize is that this stuff does not have to be intimidating. It doesn't have to be scary. It's just a matter of understanding the why. And once you understand the why, it opens up, you know, like Catherine was talking about that whole idea of watching your child like a scientist. Once you understand some of those whys, it becomes so much easier to see all that when you're, when you're seeing what your children are doing. Um, and so we really look at that, um, you starting for all children, uh, we just want to be really global in offering a ton of sensory and offering a ton of fine motor. Um, I always emphasize that when I'm talking with parents that the thing is, is that sometimes with these things, you aren't going to recognize that your child's having a challenge until much later. You know, lots of times fine motor, you won't really realize there's a problem until about second or third grade when they're really being asked to be upright more and do more, uh, you know, long desk work and, and being able to handwrite, you know, four paragraphs at once. And then suddenly it's like, oh, I don't know if I got the stamina for that, you know? And so um, backing all that up to those infant, toddler and preschool years and realizing, you know, all of a sudden that's when like the light bulb flashes that that time that that child spent rolling and rolling and rolling Play-Doh, that time that that child spent at easels making a big arm movement, all of that matters later. Their trunk strength directly correlates to their handwriting later. And so once you can really understand how to view everything through the why, it makes it all kind of click together and it's become simple activities that you can provide at home, like having them simply paint the side of your house with water, like having a big paintbrush, um, like the kind you'd actually paint the house with and a bucket. And they can, they get that visual difference because they're changing the color of your house with the water, but they're getting that big arm movement with a heavier tool, like a grown up paintbrush. So those are all the kinds of things that will, you know, come out as you learn more about this and become simple, easy, inexpensive things that you can provide at home. I, I think that's awesome. I, I, my son Forrest always helps me with, um, I guess, little home improvement projects. He has the kid versions of the, the screw guns and the screwdriver and all that. But one of the things that I learned from you guys is that real matters. And um, to, to give him like a hammer and a nail and to start like us, us doing that work together until he can start doing it himself. Um, you know, he's, he's actually really good at using a screw gun at five, which is pretty impressive to me because my dad just basically let me hold a flashlight. And so to have him be able to use tools right now is, is fun. He's helped, helped me repaint our office over in Fort Myers. So yeah, he was just having a blast, uh, until he just got interested in something else. And I think the, the willingness to, allow kids to engage with us in what we would kind of consider like a like grown up work um, that oh they're too little I, I I remember Catherine one time you you told me that as soon as your children could walk that meant they could help carry groceries in and Forrest ever since he was little and the same thing's going to happen with Charlie and I give Phoenix some things too I'm like okay <laughs> I see you have hands let's carry some things into, into the car and they get such a a sense of joy and and belonging in the family and we have all done this family work together it's it really helps build their confidence and, and feeling like hey listen i've got to contribute here and it's kind of fun i enjoy doing it so um the, the, speaking of those kinds of things uh i wanted to touch base on if you are going to i want from each of you um jessica you mentioned like the paintbrush and that got me thinking well what are some simple things that we could do around the house that we might have or would be fairly inexpensive to get uh, that might meet 
those children's, uh, we, we talk about the senses, and I just want to make sure that I'm defining it for everybody who might be a little confused. So where is up is, is one of the basic senses. You mentioned the core strength and stability. Um, where are my body parts at is another one. As we talk about things like the posting and the fine motor, what does normal touch feel like? Um, we're familiar with seeing and hearing and, and tasting and smelling, but there are these internal senses as well that are important for children to understand. Even like, am I hungry? Am I full? Do I need to use the toilet? Right? right? Um, if you are going to give us three, let's say, um, of your favorite little things to have around the house for children to start experimenting with, uh, Catherine, what, what, would you, what would you say that, that parents could either use around their home now or be real easy to, to go to the store and grab and they can start using it tomorrow? That's really hard to narrow it down. I so know. My, keeping you at three. my philosophy and what we do in our home is that the rule of thumb is that in each environment so in my kitchen environment um jessica you know mentioned the the cabinet so alina has one cabinet that is her yes cabinet and it's got real items in it so i just take items i mean you can get them at the dollar store if you want but i get a real whisk a real spoon you know all of the same things that she sees me pulling out of the drawers and she has them in her cabinet um it's not that she doesn't go in my pot and pan cabinets. Um, I've never in all of my years had to have baby locks on any of my cabinets um, because they're satisfied because they have the real. So my philosophy is in the kitchen, I have a, an area that is designated for items that I would be using in the kitchen, measuring cups. Um, again, that area is probably the cheapest and easiest to, to fill because you really can go to the dollar store and get everything. Um, Montessori Services is another really great, very great website to get little little items that actually work and are quality, um, like little miniature juicers that they can take an orange and like turn it. Um, so that website is montessoriservices.com and that's a great tool to get some additional, just higher quality products. Um, but like I said, you could do everything at dollar store if you wanted. So again, then you move to the, di the den or that living space. And that's where I'm going to have a lot of their posting. I'm going to have a shelf set up that's going to have work that they can do. It's going to have books. It's going to have the items similar to what we might be doing um, in that space. So it's again, in each space in, in the bedroom, they're going to have their bedroom set up and they're going to have the items that are calming. Um, she, my daughter has like a little, one of the brushes. So we do brushing activities at night before going to bed um you know we have scarves that we play with that are different colors so that you know you can do the peekaboo so in each space has a little bit of different items but I really feel strongly that your home is their home and I do find that parents want to sometimes it's it's their space and they don't think about that the child needs those items so then they keep bothering and become a nuisance because they're constantly taking the magazines of your your stuff and they're taking your items off you're constantly saying i've got to baby proof all of these because they don't they don't they don't have a sense of self they don't have well, there are, sorry, sorry to interrupt you Catherine, but or the opposite that you go into some people's homes and it looks like a childcare center mm -hmm. because they've inundated with thinking that they have yeah. to provide Everything. all these toys and all these plastic toys for their children in order to give them what they need to play with. Yes. And so um, in some kids, I was the first grandchild on both sides of the family and in, in my family. So let me tell you, sometimes your kids just have a lot of stuff because your family loves them. And so I'm not picking on that, but I'm just saying like fair people shouldn't feel like that's what they have to be able to do right. in order to do well by their children. No, that, Sorry, that's a very, very <laughs> important because I will say this being the fourth I, and I have a lot of the materials from my Montessori classroom, but I rotate. So you mm -hmm. never have everything out at one time. Um, you know, currently she's very... Um, my Alina is really engaged in all the real like Schleck animals. So we categorize them and she tells me all the sounds that they are, that they make, but we don't have, I have thousands of them. Okay. Mm -hmm. and I don't, don't go buy thousands of them. You will go bankrupt. This is a collection I've had for 17 years. Um, but I rotate them. 
So right now she has a little set that's farm animals and she has a little set that's birds and we keep them separate. So we have a basket of the birds and we have a basket of the farm animals and she is learning to sort them. At one years old, she knows which basket they go in. And does she, is she perfect with it? No, but there's a sense of order. And eventually, because it's always expected, it goes back. Again, that makes it way easier when you have very few items out and the items are set up in a way that is very orderly. So you're right, you don't wanna walk in a home and it just have everything. Um, so less is way better. Um, and you do want there to be a specific place. So if I have a posting activity, like the one I mentioned where she's putting the bangles, it goes in the same place every time. It has a home, just like your remote has a home or your vase that has flowers in it is sitting on your, it has a home. Everything has a home and our children should have that same respect. So I do that in my environment. Each environment has their things, but they are also presented in a very orderly and not overwhelming, overwhelming way. So rotating items, I think is probably the, the biggest is put it, get a trunk, put the things in a trunk that you don't need right now, put them in the garage and in a month, switch them out. If you don't see, that's where the science comes in. If you do not see your child ever touch an object, I have purchased for Alina because I just loved it. And I had the financial, I purchased things and she's never touched it. They have to go away. They don't need to sit there because you're tied to them and you want them to do it. They will find a way to, you know, create that same lesson in a different way. Um, so that's another good piece of advice that, you know, we have to kind of let go of our own attachment <laughs> towards things. And when you have multiple children, you'll have a child that loved one thing. You have the next child, they don't want anything to do with it. And you have to honor that. Um, so I, I don't think that I could narrow it down other than saying that each space needs to have something for that child and I mean and that moves into even the bathroom so if any of you don't know me I am like the toilet expert <laughs> so I do a whole toileting class as well but you know my one-year-old is already using the toilet all three of my girls were toileted by between 12 months and 18 months of age Alina already tells me every time she has a bowel movement she's telling me when she's wet um, all of that is because of the connections I've created because her, her diapers and ev her wipes and everything are in the bathroom. So she has a home in the bathroom and her things go there and she knows where these objects go and what it does. So this is, is it, for me, it's a very broad, make sure that your children have a, a space in each of your rooms, um, that mirror what you do in those rooms. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, think, I think you brought up some some very excellent points about that. Uh, that that it's not necessarily about this the, the thing so much uh, in your home, but necessarily wh where the order is, and and so that that children can participate in something that's real too. Um, yeah, great, Jessica. How about for uh, for, for, for tips from you? Um, well, I had a little more time to think than Catherine, so I wasn't able to think of two specific things. But then I got so engaged in what she was saying, I never came up with a third because I was too busy. <laughs> Um, but, uh, one I would recommend is a swing. Um, this does not mean you have to go buy a $3,000 fancy piece of playground equipment from Lowe's or somewhere. Um, you can have a hammock chair. You can have, you know, a good old fashioned little swing that you hang from a tree in your yard. Um, certainly over the years of working in child care I've, I've been to child cares and and seen the home child cares and stuff where they even as simply as put up like a, a clothesline tea post and then hang especially if you just have a young you know that might not work for an eight-year-old but for little guys you can just hang a small little swing that's close to the ground there um, important things to realize about children is that they need to perceive risk doesn't mean you have to give them a lot of risk they don't need a swing that's eight feet off the ground even if you, especially when you're talking about a little guy, you're talking about like Catherine's little Alina. If that swing is six inches off the ground, that's fine. Like she's still going to perceive, but the, the, the movement 
for them of getting to be able to swing. So, and if you have a lot of access, like you're going to the park every day or your children are in another setting where they're getting swing time every day, then it's probably not as necessary. But I know we've been discussing a little bit how parents have been taking on more of this role um, since the pandemic began. And so I definitely wanted to mention if I would find a way to provide some kind of swing for my children at home. Um, I love those web swings because they're so um, versatile for ages and you know whether a child's just laying on it on their belly versus when they're older and they're standing up on it. Um, another thing I would say is a basket of balls. Having a good collection of different sizes and shapes of balls in a basket. Again, that's something whether a child is infant or eight, they can use those. They're going to use them in much different ways, but that is the kind of inexpensive thing that you can collect over time and have. Um, and like I said, I only got to two because I was too busy listening to Catherine. <laughs> So uh, tell me more about the basket of balls. What is it that, that you're looking to... Uh... Um, so when they're real little, it's going to be the filling and the dumping. Um, as they get older, you're going to be rolling back and forth. You're going to get to a point when they get older that they're throwing them. Um, it can help you redirect if you have a child who needs to get out physical. And it's not a time that you can take them outside. They can throw their balls into the basket stand here and throw all your balls into the basket. Like, please do not go throw the cat off the stairs or please do not go shove your brother over just to get his attention. Come over here and throw this basket, up, <laughs> throw these balls into the basket. Uh, bean bags also work really well for that. Throw the bean bag into the basket. That is a game that has lasted me with my own children and in classrooms for my entire career. Um, and when you have a child who is showing you that they need to get out that physical energy right now and you're not in a place to bring them to go do that outside or somewhere else, like that is a great physical output indoors is take this basket and throw the stuff in it. It's one of the very first in infancy. It is one of the very first cause and effects that they can learn on their own too, because a ball is going to naturally roll. So when it is close to them and they attempt to touch it, it moves. So it is one of those first experiences of cause and effect that they can start to play with and experiment with. And that's one of, I love watching them experiment with balls. The other thing that is really great to take it with the infancy that I don't think we give as much attention to um, unless you're kind of trained in the eye, it is one of the best opportunities to determine your child's social development. So children make eye contact, they roll balls. And it is so interesting of all the years, there are children that do not roll a ball to another student. And it's telling, it's very telling. Um, so as a young, you know, when they are young, they should be willing to roll a ball to another, to another person. And they are looking for a reaction. They want those faces to light up and then they should light up when you catch it. So watching those ex exchanges, it's one of the first social exchanges that you can kind of really scientifically observe as well, um, by using a basket of balls. So I agree. That's a great one. So I'm, I'm glad that you brought up the, the social interaction because we're social creatures by nature and a lot of families have felt very isolated um, recently. And so um, some of that has come into the, the situation where maybe we're back in school and our children are having a little bit of a rough time. I know that those, those comments when we, have our, when we have our group discussions and pathways about my kids struggling, it's really been a big fire lit underneath me over this last year is how do I help more kids uh, as they're struggling with, with either their focus or attention or mental health or anxiety. Um, and so one of the things I've really respected about the two of you is that you tend to give really amazing advice about, about being <laughs> present with your kids. Um, and Catherine, you mentioned too, because I wanted to, to come back to this, uh, some of your advocacy work too. So, uh, but Jessica, I wanted to start off with you. You, you wrote something um, not too long ago to a parent uh, who was having some struggles that I thought was, was very compassionate. And um, also you, you have the, you just said, you've always had this way about you of making people feel at ease, you know, and, and, and accepting with grace about where you are right now. Um, if, if when we're looking, if you were gonna give one piece of advice to parents who are working within a school system, uh, whether it's public or private, or even homeschooling, uh, for a child who might be struggling, who's a little bit older, um, what would what would you say to them? How 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 could they how could they get? To Ooh, that's a tall order. Um, <laughs> give me a moment. Um, I definitely always find my words better if I have some kind of specific example. But sure. I think in general, um, you know, everything that you were just saying about. Um, 
all of us want to do the best we can for our kids. And um, in everyone's own way, shape or form, they take that seriously. And so it is very easy as a parent to feel a lot of pressure. And so um, if I was a parent who was in a position where my child was struggling with something and I was starting to feel pretty stressed about that, the first thing I would want to do is make sure that I just take the time with that child to find some beauty in something, to back up and laugh about something, because you're going to need that, that step back. Um, and um, I actually will share or maybe overshare an example from my own life. Uh, one of my own children is struggling a little bit with some social things right now and just, uh, and is sometimes expressing some self-talk that I wish he didn't have and I wish I could somehow take away or mix for him. Um, last night I just pulled out a really happy picture, just a really great family moment. It's not like a family photo, like a we're all lined up. It's it's a like a snapshot, candid photo. And I said, "Tell me about how this makes you feel." And um, and then I held him really tight. He just he's a big kid. <laughs> like these aren't these aren't two year olds. These are nine and ten year olds. And my boys are big. If anyone's met them, and he was just like a little ball up against my chest, like a baby. And I was holding him, and I said tell me how this makes you feel. And then I really talked to him about the fact that you can choose this feeling. Like it is okay to have your negative feelings and you can have them and you can feel them, but then it is okay to exhale those away. It is okay to let those go and to make a choice to bring in these other feelings that are still there, even if it's hard, you know, to imagine them in that moment. And you need to remind yourself, I'm not always going to feel this way when things are feeling real negative. And, um, I think that, you know, harder part than kids is us grownups. It's remembering ourselves to do that or remembering ourselves to say, this isn't always going to feel this way. This isn't always going to be this terrible. I can step back and find a solution. Um, and um, where we're in the midst of the muck and mire with our kids, that's hard. I, I, it's almost helpful you ask me this question because I struggle with this myself right now um, because you want the very best for your kids and you want to not miss an opportunity to um, do the right thing by them or help them with something. And so remembering to just kind of step back and have those solid moments. Um, I don't think sometimes we give ourselves enough credit as to how much that's going to benefit in the long run. Um, is there anywhere else you wanted me to go with that? In terms no, of I thought that was perfect. That, that was exactly as I was, I was thinking about the reasons that I, that I've loved you for years. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here trying to like hold back some, some, some mysterious liquid that seems to be appearing in my eyes uh, you know, <laughs> about holding your son and saying, Hey, listen, you know, tell me how this makes you feel. Uh, because a lot of kids are, are really uh, feel unsettled right now. And, and it's, it's tricky for them looking at the exterior, like fear and anxiety that everybody else is reflecting. They're full of these mirror neurons. Like that's the reason why we talked about real things is because their brains pick up, Oh, this is how I'm careful with this work because mom's being careful with this cutting work right now. But they're they're doing the same thing reflectively, like learning how to be emotional beings right now and how to socially interact in an environment that is very much not normal. And so to be able to find some regularity and compassion for ourselves is one of the things that when I'm talking with parents about just imagining the state like that you want to be in, visualizing on a regular basis, who do I want to be as a parent? And then when you get in those times, whether it's conflict or stress, have you know this some space to come back to is this how i want to be in this moment we're not going to be perfect and it, it, we all mess up but being able to be honest with our children about that too so they can see that we're human as well we're not we're not superhuman you know avengers that never make mistakes right we, we screw up too and to, to be able to have open and honest conversations with them about that i think is is a really important parenting tip uh, Catherine, you're, you've been doing some advocacy work for children who've been struggling to or having some, some tougher times in school or uh, with, with learning. And I'd like you to be able to share some of the things that, uh, let's say that we do have a child that's been kind of slipped through the cracks, right? Uh, these things didn't show up until second or third grade, and, and now we aren't really sure what to do. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you would approach um, you know, school or, or education at home uh, with, with the child who, who seems to have, have some special needs? Um, well, first and foremost, I just think it's important for parents to understand that you sign a document at any meeting that you go to that says that you were not um, 
withheld from bringing whoever you wanted to the meeting. Okay, that that statement is huge, and I don't think anyone necessarily even knows what it means. I think a lot of times we think, oh, they told me I could bring my spouse, um, but what it is really indicating is that you're allowed to bring an advocate. Um, and I strongly recommend everyone to have an advocate there because you are a parent, you are emotional. I myself have been at my own meetings um, and I have the legal background for the advocacy work um, in my brain. But when I am in my own meetings for my own children, you're not able to keep it together. You are there, they're talking about your baby. Um, so I just find it very, very important for you to seek someone. It can be a friend of yours. It's someone that's going to be there to take notes, to make sure that everything they're going to come, they're going to have your questions written for you so that if you forget to ask a question, they're going to say the question. Um, you know, it can be as simple as that. So it can be as simple as a friend that's just going to keep you on track and help you hear and process it. And it gives you one other person to hear what that person said and then make sure you understood it. Um, but my, the work I'm doing on the, the legal side of it is the, the advocacy trainings and things that I've had actually allows me to know the legal wherewithal of what they can and cannot do and what they should be doing or what they may not offer, but you could ask for. Um, most parents do not realize that you can ask for testing at any time. They have 60 days to do the testing here in Florida if you formally request it. Most parents wait for schools to do it. Um, so there's a lot of that type of nitty gritty that um, either they can call me and we can chat before a meeting or I can go to meetings, um, you know, and there's other people in town that can do the same or you can have your friend, but it's to know these questions and to know, um, and I don't wanna ever say that the schools don't want what's best. As Jessica and I have both said, educators do not have child development backgrounds. They don't. They do not know the depths that the three of us know. So I don't necessarily blame them. I don't, um, I have compassion for them. They're all doing their best. They're trying to offer interventions. They're trying to manage, you know, 15 kids in the class and figuring out, but to ask them to see those children with the eyes that I've been trained to see, they can't do that. Um, so I don't necessarily think that anyone's not wanting to do the best, but I'm seeing that schools don't necessarily always have the right answers or aren't always advocating to the to the degree. One of the most obvious that happened to me when I first went into the public sector um, in Lee County, actually, I was working with OTs. My background in OT was phenomenal working at Renaissance. I had several OTs that came to my school and worked with children. And they would tell the parents, you don't need therapy. Your child has therapy every day in this classroom. Your child doesn't need me, but your insurance pays for it so you can keep coming two days a week. So they got therapy every day. Um, but once they get to the elementary classroom, we make them sit in desk. We, and, and some schools are getting better. They're providing the exercise balls. They're doing variety of seating and, I, and they're trying. But the deep down is that I spoke to the OT that was on my one of my caseloads. I had a child that had no handwriting ability, fine motor, pincer grip, totally not things. They could not do a lot of the motor work that just seemed missing, but they could write. They, they could write letters on paper. When I tell you that it was very not, I mean, it was, you could read it but it was not their potential. But guess what the OT said? That's not what we, we're just here to make it good enough. Once it's good enough, they don't need us anymore. Same thing with speech. I see it in the school systems. They do it till it's good enough. I'm never okay with good enough. I want- Blooming. <laughs> I want blooming. I want their fullest potential. And I feel like we have the resources in our community. Are they the, do we have a ton of therapy places? Absolutely not, but we have enough 
And we have a school system full of people. That was the other thing the OT mentioned when I said that this child really needed some sensory work, that that was what I saw was holding him back in his writing. They said, oh, we don't do sensory therapy here. We don't work on any of the sensories. I'm just here to make their handwriting legible. Okay, great. But there's more to this. OT means you are integrating all of this. And so to compartmentalize that you're here to make sure they're legible, they're looking at how can we just make sure they can present their information? Can they, can they write what they need to write? Can they express what they need to express? Can they read to learn? And we're not looking at this human potential, which is what the three of us see so much more. Um, children are born with human tendencies. That's the, the phrase, that's the terminology that we use in Montessori. There are human tendencies that drive everything. We can sit back and not offer them a single item. Maria Montessori walked into her classroom the first time observing children and they had a cabinet that was locked. And she watched them playing with dust balls and dirt on the ground to come up with her philosophy. You don't need anything. But what you do need is the opportunity to observe a child and allow them to drive themselves with these human tendencies. When we impart our information on them, we many times hold them back from what that inner drive is gonna take them to do. Um, so I see that in schools that we, we kind of shut down that inner drive. We kind of halt them from reaching their potential because in schools, we have set up schools and that is as long as time in the industrial nature. We've set them up to be the, the bell curve. We just need kids to be good enough. They don't have a clue what to do with the kids that are really advanced. And they, they try hard to work with the lower ones, but they aren't hitting the targets that I see they could hit because we are not doing the sensory work or we're not, you know, we're only doing the things that affect academics and they're forgetting that if they can't throw a ball or push a heavy object or they're uncoordinated when they walk, you're never going to get them to write. Why are you trying to make them write? You need to make them do these other things. So that's you know, one kind thing of you mentioned. One thing you mentioned was the different seating, and that's um, you're just such a prime example of that intentionality that we were discussing. Mm -hmm. It, it, you know, we all have our phases of knowledge and development that we go through on our journey, and so it is awesome. We have teachers at a place where they're recognizing that the variety of seating is helpful doesn't mean they know how to use it mm -hmm. right I see that a lot that mm -hmm. they they have it but then it almost becomes it, it's like then the child doesn't do their work because they're lounging and they don't know how to set up the guidelines and the limits within it and then they're not using it for therapeutic reason it's like another plaything in the room they don't need it you need the children that really need it there's certain children that need a different type of seat. They, some children need the rocking seats. Some children need the bouncing seat. Some children need something that compresses them. Some children need a lap blanket that sits on them that's weighted while they're at their desk. They actually don't need any kind of movement of a chair. They need something to steady their body. So I don't think teachers, and again, I go back to that compassion, they don't know how to know that, but that's where our OT and our specialists in our school systems should be doing that work, but I don't necessarily see that in the public sector done to the fullest potential, which is where my work kind of came in that I was able to provide that, but I can't hit every kid. So again, as COVID has hit, it's kind of embraced me to be able to sit in on the meetings. It started out helping my own friends, um, Jessica, and all of my friends that I have and saying, these are the questions you have to ask. These are the things that you can do. So it's kind of just blossom into that opportunity for me to advocate and help parents navigate. These are legal documents and we are due, every child is due a fair and equivalent education. What that looks like, we don't always know what to ask for. And I have the ability to, to use my wealth of information and development to know the questions, to be able to get what will really, could be the one thing that sets children apart um, and legally know how to navigate that system. Um, because the system is not 
meant to be easy. It's almost feels like it's meant to be hard because then they don't have to do as much. I, I hate to say it in that way, but I don't see that we are using the specialist in our programs for what you, the three of us would use them for. I, yeah. I just, I don't see it. I, I mean, perfect example, my children needed, um, they have auditory processing and that is diagnosed by a speech and language and, a, and an audiologist. Speech and language therapists are who do the therapy if you go outside of the schools. Do you think the public school does any of that therapy in the school system? They don't even acknowledge it. They don't even know what it is. And when you bring it up, they have to, by law, give you an accommodations for it because it is a diagnosable disorder, but they don't know what to do with it. They don't understand it. And then when they start to understand it, then they start to say, well, that could be what Joey and Sammy and oh my gosh, like this has just opened my eyes. I've had that happen by me talking about my own children. Teachers have been like, just, I mean, lightning bolts go off. Like, well, wait a minute. That's what this is. Um, so hundred percent. I was going to say the same thing that you as a teacher, and hopefully you know, more and more teachers grow to the place that to learn that the investment in learning about all of this pays you back a hundredfold. And if you are of the mindset, you think, why do I have to bother with understanding and learning all this for this one kid? That's where you're mistaken because Doc brought this up early in our conversation here this afternoon that we're all on a, there's a spectrum. You know, we're all a little quirky. It's a matter of whether these quirks in your life impact your work, family, school. That's when things are to a point where you are diagnosable or need therapy or whatever. But we all we all have our things. And so for every intervention that you learn, every technique that you learn that might be to help little Phyllis, who's in your class right now, but the fact is that that tip and trick is now in your toolbox as a teacher and that is going to help you time and time again with children who may never be diagnosed with children who may not need to be diagnosed but it still helped them be their best because you were able to insert that right and I you know that brings up another good point because using those they're using these therapeutic like they told me that my classroom was therapeutic and I know your classrooms are the same thing um, they're therapeutic so we may be the people that keep them from needing the therapy, but I also want to say, you know, a shout out to those parents that have had to do it. I went and purposely got diagnoses for my children because I wanted to seek the therapies and I wanted insurance to cover it and I wanted the schools to honor it. So I wasn't scared of getting labels. Um, most recently, I got the diagnosis of ADHD just so I could move forward and get the, the, the need that my child had, even though that's not the primary, but it was the easiest target. Um, I think people are scared. And, and I also understand that fear of going with ADHD because it is a very misknown. Um, most of the time, it is a different disorder that is presenting as ADHD. I see that 10 times more than anything else. Um, so you do have to be careful, but that's where that advocacy is important, that if you have the right advocate, I have sat through meetings where the parents said, oh, well, they said it was ADHD, so all they can get is extra time. I have now sat in, and most recently in the past three months, in three different ADHD, and I've gotten everything from oral presentation to their materials to talk to text because of the shutdown it creates. Um, I can, we can formulate the data and prove it's about what does this child need and how can we better support them? Um, we want to create that equivalency for them. We want to create equal playing ground. Um, the only thing that I, we, we didn't, we've talked a lot about how COVID has brought parents home and I don't know how much time we have, but I also want to acknowledge that the sensory world right now, not just are we home, but our children that could have been okay or not presenting things may be in these days presenting. And that is because there's different sensory output. So take just the smell. Our children are now in classrooms that are being fogged every night. 
Our children are in classrooms that have every object sprayed down with, I don't know what chemical. It was one of the primary reasons that I did not send my children back to school right away. Um, we are not here to determine how that affects our children. So even if you aren't at home or you are, and you are using cleaners in your own home, even if they're natural, I mean, Jessica's a perfect, my, my sweet little son of hers, I try all the time to get him to like my oils and he sensory overload for him too much. <laughs> so here we are sanitizing everything, spraying our hands, washing our hands way more that that alone, washing your hands creates a, a sensitivity to children. So if they're washing their hands even more than they're used to, that sensory input could change everything. And so when we as parents sit back and say, what is going on with our child? I think this COVID again, that is changing our world and who knows where it's going, who knows when it's gonna stop or how it's gonna change, or if it's here, I, I'm not here to make that determination other than to say that we really need to look at the sensory things that they are, that have changed for them and appreciate that that might be why some of their behaviors have changed. You know, when you've got a muffled mask, some of us don't wear them, some of us do, but if they're going to school, they're listening to teachers that have muffled masks, their hearing perceptions are now off. They're having to listen more clearly. They're having to listen more carefully. Um, they're not getting the hugs that they used to have because teachers aren't allowed to touch your children. You Now the compressions that children would get on a regular basis, they're not getting. So when they come home and they're flying off the handle and they're running around crazy and you wanna say, what is wrong with you? I'm not doing anything different. Their entire world is different. So yeah, they yeah, aren't yeah. getting the feedback that they need. Yeah, you, you so, brought up some really important points. I mean, the, the, the things that, that come into our offices are about you know understanding with parents, you mentioned ADHD, Sometimes you, you need a diagnosis, but a teacher will look at the chemical issue that is ADHD um, and mistake that uh, as the diagnosis when it could be a processing issue of, of how the sensory systems are working or not working or not being engaged. And, and you're right that if there's a lot of things that we can do at home to help with that brain development, but if a child is getting stuck, even if they are going to an OT or even if they are going to a speech therapist, I've seen it so many times that sometimes some clarity of information. That's basically what the whole reason why a chiropractor is, is, is doing something like this is because someone taught me that one of the things that I do is help organize sensory information when I adjust someone. And so like, as we're looking for all these different tools of what is it that we can do if parents do get stuck, being able to have resources like our pathways group to say, well, where did this whole like sitting in rows come from and reading an article by Charles Eisenstein about, well, industrial revolution said you had to follow rules and you got to follow in line. Otherwise you don't get paid and then you don't eat. Right. And the what? output is all the same. Did you know that? Because we as humans are all the same and you're going to oh, get right. the same yeah. output. Yeah. Well, and especially as we're, as we're looking at how kids are, are now working, you know, you know, you look at the millennials who are, who are you know, working from home or they have gig jobs or you know, playing video games to make money. I mean, the YouTube streamers, there's, there's like all so many different ways that people can be successful in, in the world today. And, and one thing that I've always learned is that humans are exceptionally adaptable. Right. So I think that, that even if we, we have some of these things that might be causing a little chaos internally, um, and then obviously that has to blow out when you're a kid, it has to find that outlet, um, trying to figure out how to, how to kind of get back to some normalcy, figure out how to reach out in our community because we're social beings. Um, it's why, you know, I, I love hosting things like this. I love getting experts like you guys on. Um, and one of the things I want to leave parents with is, is that, is that, that hope and how to reach out. So, um, uh, we do need to wrap up. I, what I wanted to, to offer is if any of you guys want to get in contact with either, you know, Jessica or with Catherine, um, how do they get in touch with you in your, in, in, in your places or reach out to you? Jessica. Well, I'm the director at the Learning Tree Preschool in Fort Myers, and um, you can find it. We have a website, and also my email is learningtree15 at yahoo.com, and um, I can't say anything more except for that. I, I tell parents all the time. I speak to parents, and I say, even if you don't end up choosing our school, you know what? Here's a great book, or even if you don't end up choosing our school, call me when you need a good 
swim instructor referral or whatever. Like, so um, it's not always about necessarily needing to choose our school. It doesn't fit for everybody, but um, you're still welcome to call me. You're still welcome to tour just to even see what it's like. Might spark an idea for you and something else. Um, but do know that we are very, very welcoming to working on these things uh, in the classroom. We have, um, like you were saying, like a, a therapeutic classroom because it's a classroom that already looks through this lens. And um, one of our most recent um, enrollees from a couple of years ago that had a more severe um, autism, I just remember, and I will always be impacted and humbled by the fact that his mother told me when I was calling around looking for schools, you were the only one I talked to that when I told you my son had autism, your voice didn't change on the phone. And so I think um, remembering that although we do have a wide community full of resources, parents don't always have an easy time accessing them. Mm -hmm. um, and so knowing that there are places where you can find that um, is reassuring to parents and just always know that I'll be one of those places for you. Oh, beautiful. Kath Catherine, how, how, how do people get in touch with you? Um, so as I said, I'm staying home currently and working mainly doing advocacy. I um, do run a Facebook group as well called The Mindful Nest. Um, I've had that since I was at um, Renaissance in the Montessori and have just maintained that and kind of using that platform um, for my advocacy work as well as private tutoring. Um, so I am doing tutoring either for setting up environments um, or actually working one-on-one -on -one with children. Um, you can find me at Mindful Nest um, is my um, business name and it's at the honored child dot at gmail.com. But I am more than happy to handle any of your questions. I, like Jessica, am just passionate about helping. You don't know how many phone calls I've had that I don't charge what I should because I just want to help. And I just, I start when someone says that they're struggling and then I just feel badly and I just want to get the connections out there. And if I don't have the answers or the resources, I try to get you where you need to be. So um, I'm more than happy to answer any kind of legal questions if it comes to your 504s or IEPs, um, or if you are you know, have a child that you are wanting me to work with, I can also do that. But again, it's through Mindful Nest and I do have a group and thehonoredchild at gmail.com. Excellent. I mean, we could literally do a full day workshop on this kind of stuff. I just, I feel like like the hour just flew by and we just scratched the surface on some of these topics. Mm -hmm. um, I did so not get to some of the things I wanted to talk about. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> yeah. And so, and may, maybe that's an opportunity for later on. I mean, one of the things that, that we've, we've been moving into with our Pathways group are master classes like this, are the ability to do more things with conscious parenting. And um, I, I really think, like I said, the, the two of you have been such important pillars in our community for such a long time. And so to, to be able to, to utilize this, if you're new on your parenting journey and, and you're trying to figure out, well, I feel kind of strange, but I don't know where else to turn. I mean, this is, this is the community for us. So I really want to thank all of you for participating. Um, again, if, if you have, if you, ha if this conversation resonated with you, I really, really encourage you to share it um, with, with your friends, with your family members, if they aren't really understanding your journey, or if you happen to see that you have a friend or a family member that is also kind of like struggling and they don't really know what to do or where to turn. Uh, I know this will be, have been worth the listen for them. So please feel free to do that. And if you do have questions about things, we have a comments box. Uh, this, this video will be shared in multiple places. So we have a YouTube channel. We have our, our Pathways uh, Connect Southwest Florida page or Pathways Connect Sarasota page. This will be on and also be on our Mama's Chiropractic page. And, and it'll probably get shared through our personal pages as well. Um, so by all means, uh, all of us are, are monitoring those comments and we're happy to chip in. Just, just feel free to tag us if you'd like to. So uh, until next time, I hope you all take great care. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Jessica, very much for, for playing today. And I look forward to seeing you guys all in person and giving you one of those nice big hugs that you were just talking about. Yes, you, you are allowed to do that. Please do. <laughs> and just really take, take the time. I just want to leave it with you guys. Get your children out there and experience the sensorial world. It is there for us to appreciate and enjoy and interact with. So just get your children out there and interacting. And by that, they will embrace the potential that they have. So that's perfect. All right. 
Have a great night, everybody.